Welcome you all to daily editorial analysis. Today's date is 30th of July 2024. Today we are going to discuss these three editorial articles from The Hindu and Indian Express. So just watch the full video and leave your comments in the comment section. Without delay, we will get into the article discussion. Look at this editorial article from The Hindu. This article talks about census. Now currently census is in the editorial page because the center did not extend the deadline of June 30th to freeze the administrative boundaries for the purpose of census. This is what the article is talking about. So in this news article discussion, we shall learn about certain facts related to census. So let's begin with what is census. See census is nothing but a systematic process of collecting, recording and analyzing population data. So it is usually done by government and research foundation for better planning and program implementation. The first systematic census was conducted in the year 1881 and it continued till 2011 every 10 years. Okay, There was a gap in between because of the COVID-19. Remember the responsibility of a decadal census is with the office of a registrar general and census Commissioner of India under the Ministry of Home Affairs. The confidentiality of the data collected through census is provided under Census Act 1948 and the population census is under union list under Article 246. Okay, so these data are very important to write in your mains answer writing. You can straight away quote these facts. So when we talk about census, we cannot leave the caste census as well, right? So what is caste census? It is also census which seeks to assess the socio-economic status of various caste. The first socio-economic and caste census was conducted in the year 1931 to identify the economic condition of various communities in India. Nodal ministry is ministry of home affairs. So with this basics about census and caste census let us understand the difference between the census and the caste census see census is actually focused on general public and its confidentiality is protected under census act 1948 but when it comes to caste census it is related to the specific community the personal information will be used by the government department for benefit distribution and for allocation so this is the major difference between census and the caste census. So let's talk about the census and the delimitation. See, one of the primary objective of 1881 census was delimitation. Here, those who don't know what is delimitation, it is the process of rearranging or redrawing the boundaries of electoral constituencies. This is done based on the latest census to ensure fair representation of minority community okay for example if a constituency records a majority population of scheduled caste then a constituency will be reserved for the scheduled caste so this is a practical example of delimitation and the census now we shall see about certain challenges with respect to the caste census see the first thing is the complex nature of caste system in india there are thousands of caste and sub caste in india and their nature and recognition vary across different region this will bring hurdle in data collection okay so the first thing is complex nature second is politicization the caste census data will be misused for political gains and extension or removal of reservation can lead to tension in the society thirdly social division See, the focus of census can increase the social division and stigmatization. Apart from this, there are issues like uh, training and the manpower to conduct a vertical caste, to conduct vertical census like caste census. It needs increased manpower and training. Then we require uh, cooperation from people. If the people don't cooperate, this can lead to misreporting and underreporting. Then social changes, this include an increased number of intercaste marriage and the evolving nature of the caste system itself. Apart from this, there are certain policy implications like converting the data to feasible policies is an issue. Then finally, resistance within the administration. That is, this will affect the data collection within the administration 
process okay so these are all certain challenges of caste census now let us quickly go through the opportunities of caste census see it helps in policy making and it helps to frame targeted policy intervention and resource allocation for poverty alleviation for example the garib kalyan anna yojana secondly it leads to social justice and, in, and inclusion the data from caste census can be used for empowering minority rights then it ensures a political representation so here the data from caste census will be used for political parties and government to ensure the fair representation of the minorities okay then it helps in employment especially the caste census data will be used for understanding the composition of a particular community in the workforce this will help in diversification of their employment opportunity a very good example for this is the national minorities development finance corporation nmdfc loan scheme this provides concessional loan for self employment and income generating activities for the socio economic development of the backward section among the notified minorities apart from this it helps in developing the infrastructure and basic services in minority areas for example backward region grant fund this is a government program designed to redress regional imbalance in development then bridge critical gaps in local infrastructure and development requirements so for developing the infrastructure it might help and it helps in preservation of culture so when we could identify certain communities that are into degradation we can help them by identifying them using the caste census okay so talking about the way forward the caste census is an opportunity for justice and equality and also to ensure a just and harmonized society however to ensure the collection we should have a proper mechanism to ensure the confidentiality to prevent the misuse and stigmatization so these are all very important facts that you have to remember from this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw about what is census then we saw about what is caste census then we saw about what is census and how it impacts delimitation then we saw about some of the challenges then we saw about the opportunities of caste census so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion i have displayed here the main question you can write an answer and post it in the comment section okay now we shall move on to the next question look at this news article the heading itself states can states tax mining activities so this article is just an answer to this question recently we had a dispute or we had a ruling that the tax is not royalty right so this article is written in that backdrop so in this news article discussion let us understand mining regulation in india so i have displayed a question for you you can write answer for this particular question in the comment section so let's begin with the landmark cases that were given with respect to the mining regulation in india see the first important case is india cement versus state of tamil nadu 1989 see in this judgment states only have the power to collect royalties and not impose taxes on mining activities union government has overridden has overriding authority over the regulation of mines and the mineral development under the 1957 act so this is as per this judgment secondly the kesoram kesoram industries versus state of bengal in this particular case the judgment said royalty is a tax and it should be read as cess on royalty is a tax okay bench was smaller than the one in the india cement case but it was unable to overrule or amend the previous ruling okay and the recent supreme court ruling it stated that state legislature can tax mineral activities within their respective territories constrained by parliament's mines and minerals development and regulation act 1957 okay this is what the recent supreme court ruling is about so here you might have a doubt what is the distinction between tax and royalty see royalty is a payment or money paid by mining leasee to the leaser for the right to extract minerals while tax or determined by law and can only be 
levied by public authorities to fund welfare schemes and public services. So, this is the major difference between a lawyer, royalty and taxation. Talking about mineral regulation in India, see there are certain key acts that you have to remember, we shall see them one by one. So, the first important one is the Mines Act 1952. It is the primary legislation governing the Indian mine sector, then the Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act 1957. This oversees mining operations and mineral resource management. Then the third one is Coal Mines Conservation and Safety Act 1974. It is introduced to improve coal efficiency, technology and conservation of coal resources. Then the MMDR Amendment 2015. This amendment formally mandated sustainable development in mining by establishing district mineral foundation to support regions and communities affected by mining activities. Then finally comes the National Mineral Policy 2019. See its aim is to make mining more sustainable and efficient and it promotes using modern technology, speeds of the licensing process, focuses on protecting the environment and etc. The policy also seeks to create more jobs and improve local in infrastructure and it ensures far benefits for communities affected by mining. So, these are all very important the key acts and regulations that I have to remember from the perspective of mining sector. Now, let us see the challenges in mining sector. See, the first important issue is lengthy formalities that is getting a license can be a lengthy process added to the government regulations and taxations create further hurdles. Secondly, poor infrastructure, lack of uh, fundamental services where mineral res reserves are found. Usually, these regions have no significant or consistent power supply. Then the third issue is environmental impact. Mining leads to land degradation, air pollution, groundwater depletion, deforestation soil erosion, then water pollution and loss of biodiversity at the end. Fourthly, social issues. See, population displacement and resettlement is one of the many most important challenge. It also leads to health impacts and cultural destruction. Apart from this, uh, resource scarcity, economic challenges and technological challenges hinders the mining sector. Following this, let us see some of the government initiatives with respect to mining regulation in India. See, as I already said, the MMDR Amendment Act, it is that, it is a reformative measure which got amended in 2015, 2021 and 2023. Then auctioning of blocks, the central government has empowered to auction blocks for 24 critical and strategic minerals. This enhances transparency and efficiency in the allocation process. Then introduction of exploration license. This has been introduced for the 29 critical mineral exploration. Then we saw about the district mineral foundation earlier. Apart from this, there is national mineral exploration trust. This has been created to promote mineral exploration. It provides funding and support to encourage private sector involvement in exploring activities. Apart from that, we have private exploration agencies. It ensures private sector participation, the National Mineral Policy 2019 and the MCDR, it is the Rules 2017 and the Pradhan Mantri Kanij Kestra Kalyan Yojana. It helps in development projects with respect to DMF. So, these are all very important facts that you have to remember about mineral mining and mines regulation in India. So, these learned points, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this article about Israel and Hezbollah conflict. Now, as you all know, since October 2023, the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah has been significant escalations marking the most intense period of hospitality since 2006 Lebanon war. The violence began when Hezbollah fired rockets and artillery at Israel positions in solidarity with Palestine following a Hamas attack on Israel. So, this is what the article is talking about. So, in this news article discussion, let us quickly go through the history of Israel-Palestine conflict. 
and some of the peace initiative endorsed to solve the issue okay i have given a mains question with respect to the article you can write an answer in the comment section talking about the history of israel palestine conflict see during this time of world war 1 palestine was part of ottoman empire and it is home to arab muslim arab christian and jewish community after the war the ottoman empire fell and the league of nation gave britain the mandate to govern palestine this led to increased jewish migration causing tension between jewish settlers and arab palestine population second important uh, um, declaration is the balfour declaration the british government issued the balfour declaration supporting the idea of jewish homeland in palestine this declaration led to more jewish immigration moving to the region then during the world war 2 and holocaust support for jewish community grew significantly then came the un partition plan see the british handed over palestine to the united nation due to difficulties in governing the colony okay the un proposed a partition plan to create a jewish and arab state the jewish leader accepted the plan but the arab leaders rejected it okay this again led to further conflict now let us quickly see the peace initiatives that were endorsed in 2000s the first important one is arab peace initiative see arab league endorsed a saudi arabia proposal to establish normal relation with israel in exchange for an independent palestine state so the withdrawal of israel from the territories it had occupied in 1967 including the golan heights happened then the settlement of palestinian refugees became a question apart from this recognition of east jerusalem as the capital of an independent palestine state was an issue secondly the abraham accords it was signed in 2020 by uae bahrain and israel mediated by usa to normalize ties between arab gulf states and israel the third important one is the middle east peace plan it is also known as peace to prosperity It is a vision to improve the lives of the Palestine and Israeli people. It was announced by USA in 2020. It also didn't materialize as there were differences of opinion. So we have seen a lot about the history and some of the accords. Now let us see what is India's stance on this particular conflict. See, firstly, both Jawaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi vowed to support the Palestinian cause as they rejected the idea of two state on the basis of religion. Secondly, India announced its recognition of Israel on 1950 and established a diplomatic relation in 1992. So India also voted against UN resolution 1812 in 1947 which partitioned mandatory Palestine between Jews and Palestinian Arabs. Thirdly, regarding the PLO in 1975, India recognized the Palestinian Liberation Organization as the sole and legitimate representation of the Palestinian people and permitted it an independent office at New Delhi. It also it came up with a strong statement of solidarity for Palestine in non-alignment agreement 1983 that was held in Delhi. Okay? So these are all very important facts that you have to remember with respect to Israel and Palestine issue. So if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel and also share it with your friends. Once again thank you.